Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website on all of these occasions. We do salute our friends at the National Institute for Public Policy, with whom we are co-hosting this event today for the issuance of their new report. Uh, we would remind everyone in-house, if you'll be so kind to check cell phones, that they've been turned off. It's always appreciated. And our internet viewers are always welcome at any time to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion is Michaela Dodge, Policy Analyst for Defense and Strategic Policy in our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. Mrs. Dodge specializes in missile defense, nuclear weapons modernization, and arms control. She holds a master's degree in defense and strategic studies from Missouri State University, where she was awarded the Ulrich Schumacher Memorial Scholarship for two years. She received a bachelor's degree in international relations and defense and strategic studies from Masrak University in the Czech Republic. She serves as a national security fellow with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and is a former Publius fellow at the Claremont Institution. She also participates in the Project on Nuclear Issues, Nuclear Scholars Initiative of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Please join me in welcoming Michaela Dodge. Michaela. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, John, and thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Dr. Payne, Ambassador Joseph, and Rebecca. It's a great honor to introduce and um, be here with you and to introduce people that I've learned so much from. Um, first, um, Ambassador Robert Joseph, who's held numerous senior positions with the US government and who specializes in arms control policy. And he worked both in the State Department and the National Security Council during the George W. Bush presidency. After leaving the administration, he became a senior fellow at the National Institute for Public Policy and focuses mainly on missile defense, <coughs> nuclear weapons, and war fighting strategies. He also served as an advisor to the Center for Security Policy and has been a professor at various universities, including Tufts University and Tulane. Professor Keith Payne, um, is a, one of our foremost experts on nuclear weapons policy and deterrence issues. He's the founder and director of the National Institute for Public Policy, a security think tank. Um, he served as a deputy assistant secretary of defense in the first George W. Bush administration and is a head of the Missouri State University's Department of Defense and Strategic Studies program which is based in Fairfax um, in Virginia. Rebecca Heinrichs studies national defense issues. She's a visiting fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. Before her association with Heritage, um, she served as a legislative assistant on military matters to Representative Trent Franks uh, of Arizona, who is a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Um, she managed House Missile Defense Caucus, and here at Heritage, she continued her work on nuclear weapons policy and missile defense policy. Um, we will, first, Ambassador Robert Joseph will introduce the minimum deterrence report. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend it. It's an excellent report. Um, it's a consensual deport, report, and it's very important for the current discussion that we face regarding our nuclear weapons in the US. Um, then Professor Payne will follow on, um, then return word to Ambassador jo Joseph, who will talk about nonproliferation issues, and then Rebecca Heinrichs offers her comments on, on the report. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Michaela, thank you very much. It's always a great treat to come back to uh, Heritage to see and to learn from longtime friends and colleagues and in some cases uh, former students. Uh, let me begin by congratulating uh, Keith Payne, my colleague, uh, and Secretary Schlesinger, uh, who were respectively the study director and the chairman of the senior review group that produced the report that is the subject of today's presentation and discussion. 
it was a real privilege for me uh, to be asked to be one of the participants in the study. It was a pleasure uh, for me to work with so many uh, very distinguished contributors from across a wide spectrum uh, of the defense community. Uh, as you look at the list, I think you will agree that it's one of the most impressive lists of former policy and civilian national security experts as well as former uh, general officers with truly unmatched operational experience in the field. This was uh, clearly the A-team uh, from Senator Chuck Robb to Ambassadors uh, Eric Edelman and Bill Courtney uh, to Generals Larry Welsh and Kevin Chilton to Admiral Meese and Frank Miller and to many others uh, who uh, participated in the study. It was also a nonpartisan effort uh, dedicated uh, to the proposition that the U.S. nuclear deterrent continues to play an essential role in keeping our country safe in a very dangerous world. Today, the United States is entering into an era of challenge and crisis. In fact, as we've seen in the past two weeks, this era is, still, is, is very much already upon us. We are being challenged in Asia by China and others, uh, in the Middle East by Iran and others, and everywhere by Russia. We are seen by our adversaries as a country in decline and by many of our friends as a country in withdrawal, not just from Afghanistan and Iraq, but from key regions of long-standing vital interest to the United States. Both enemies and friends understand that our military capabilities, which today have no doubt are by far the world's finest, are nevertheless being reduced in just about every dimension. The effects of sequestration will only add to and accelerate the decline in our ability to act decisively on the world stage. But as rapidly as our capabilities are being reduced, the perception of our credibility as a nation of resolve, a nation that will do what it says it will do to protect American interests and those who are allied with us is eroding at an even greater speed. And I would argue with even greater and more long-lasting long consequences. The damage that was done to our credibility over the U.S. response or non-response to Syria's use of chemical weapons will last for many years. Putin won big. His mocking tone in his New York Times piece reflected the level of his contempt. Assad, the man responsible for the moral outrage of the murder by gassing of 1,400 civilians, also won big. As the opposition in Syria continues to fracture even today, we see just how much Assad has gained. The message to our enemies is clear. You can challenge the United States without fear. The message to our friends is equally clear. Maybe the United States will act with resolve and back up its commitments, or maybe not. And this is not, as you all know, a sound foundation for others to base their national security. Nowhere is this combination of declining capabilities and eroding credibility more evident than in the nuclear arena. We are pursuing as a matter of policy the illusionary goal of a nuclear-free world. At the same time, our nuclear forces and our nuclear weapons infrastructure are in decline qualitatively and quantitatively. Although inconsistent with our national security challenges, this decline is cheered on by many who subscribe to the minimum deterrence arguments, which are mostly old, tired assertions that previously achieved little traction. But these arguments and these assertions have gained support in the last five years. If we are going to reverse the negative trends in our deterrent posture, we need to take on these arguments. We need to expose them for what they are. And only by doing so will we win the intellectual debate. And only by winning that debate will we gain the support in Congress and the broader defense community that is essential to reverse the downward trajectory on which we are traveling. If we fail to reverse course, we will be increasingly challenged by our adversaries and doubted by our friends. Challenges will then lead to crises, and if history is our guide, crises will lead to conflict. This is why. Dr. Payne and Dr. Schlesinger deserve great credit for this latest report. Keith will now talk about the findings of the report, 
I'll then come back and wrap up with the report's conclusions on arms control and non-proliferation. With that, let me turn it over to Keith. Thank you, Ambassador Joseph, and, and thanks to uh, Heritage for uh, co-hosting this event with the National Institute, and to Michaela Dodge for moderating it, and for Rebecca for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I wore my Heritage tie given to me years ago by the generosity of the Heritage Foundation just for this occasion. I should say at the outset that these are my personal views and not necessarily the views of any of the institutions with which I'm affiliated, even if they should be. Uh, before the discussing the substance, I'd like to draw attention to the contributors to this study. It was my honor and privilege to work with Dr. Schlesinger, uh, who served as the chair of the senior review group, as with Ambassador Joseph on the senior review group and, and others. It's a bipartisan study, as Ambassador Joseph mentioned. If you have a copy, you'll note that Senator Kyle and Senator Lieberman uh, provided a joint endorsement to the study. Uh, the diversity of the senior review group in this case, I think, I think is unparalleled um, and unprecedented for such a study. We had a former Secretary of Defense. We had three former either SAC or STRATCOM commanders, which I believe is a first. We had two former directors of Central Intelligence. We had two former commanders of the 20th Air Force former senior officials, senior officials from the NSC, from the State Department, and DOD, and a former director from the Livermore National Laboratory. It was, it was quite a group. Um, our, the, our goal, the goal of this group, was to understand the presumptions, the conclusions, and the arguments of minimum deterrence on its own terms, and to examine each of these for consistency with available evidence and internal, internal logic. To my surprise, as we first began this uh, project, uh, our, our efforts were to find other similar projects from the past to see what we might build on. And uh, to our surprise, we could find nothing. We could find nothing that essentially deconstructed minimum deterrence, took a look at each of the piece parts for its consistency with evidence and logic. Uh, so, we, so we started fresh, and I think it turned out to be very helpful that we did. Let me mention that the consistent minimum deterrence policy recommendation across the decades, across the decades, is that the U.S. should reduce its nuclear arsenal to a finite number, uh, usually measured in either just a few or hundreds. Uh, this can be done prudently, again, it is claimed across the decades, because a relatively small finite number of U.S. nuclear weapons will be adequate for deterrence purposes uh, now and in the future. Uh, most recently, the minimum deterrence recommendation is that these reductions be undertaken in conjunction with Russia or unilaterally if necessary. The, the claim benefits by, mu by mutual deterrence advocates, again, has tended to be similar over the decades, but the most recent set of benefits are as follows. One, if the United States adopts minimum deterrence, it will provide deterrence that is more stable and with greater safety than otherwise would be the case. Two, minimum deterrence will facilitate nuclear arms control agreements and a more successful non-proliferation effort. Uh, three, minimum deterrence will provide substantial savings, substantial savings in the defense budget. And fourth, minimum deterrence will help create the conditions necessary for a more peaceful world order and uh, will help realize the goal of eliminating nuclear weapons entirely, i.e. get us to nuclear zero. Uh, these four general minimum deterrence promises basically are predicated on eight interrelated propositions or claims. These are the eight that we took on and looked at carefully. Let me just list them briefly here, uh, one, deterrence will function reliably and predictably at low force numbers. It will do so now and in the future, and in part because U.S. conventional forces can substitute for nuclear forces for deterrence purposes. Two, Russia and China are not U.S. adversaries, so U.S. relations with Russia and China are no longer pertinent to U.S. nuclear force sizing considerations. Three, U.S. nuclear weapons are irrelevant Today's, to today's most pressing threats, that is proliferation and WMD terrorism. In fact, reducing the U.S. nuclear arsenal will help 
alleviate those threats. Four, deterrence considerations alone should determine the size and composition of U.S. nuclear force requirements. Five, ballistic missile submarines will remain invulnerable for 50 more years. So a very small SSBN fleet, submarine fleet, can provide most or all of the nuclear capability that the U.S. needs now and in the future. Six, the number of nuclear weapons and the risk of accidents are directly correlated. In other words, the more nuclear weapons we have, the greater the risk of accident. And correspondingly, as we reduce the number of nuclear weapons, we will reduce the probability, the risk of accidents. Seven, U.S. nuclear force reductions are essential to and will strengthen nonproliferation efforts and further arms control progress. And the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the NPT, requires, mandates that the U.S. now and in the past uh, move towards nuclear disarmament. And finally, eight, a small number of nuclear weapons is adequate for deterrence. Thus, U.S. defense spending can be reduced considerably and without risk by reducing the number of nuclear weapons without undermining deterrence. Those are the eight, basically, core components of minimum deterrence. And you'll notice that each of these eight propositions or claims points to, one, the adequacy of a finite and small number of nuclear weapons for deterrence purposes, and to the benefits of moving to a much smaller nuclear arsenal. These were the eight that we examined for their consistency with evidence and internal logic. And what our study shows, I believe you'll find, is that when these eight core minimum deterrence propositions are examined against available evidence, it's apparent that they are either demonstrably false or contrary to evidence, or imprudent at best. Let me illustrate briefly why and how we reached this conclusion. First, for example, the minimum deterrence claim that nuclear deterrence as a rule is irrelevant to countering terrorism is demonstrably false. Terrorists can be deterred in some, in some circumstances. We know and U.S. nuclear capabilities may help deter state sponsors of terror from severely threatening forms of support uh, for their terrorist clients. Second, minimum deterrence promises substantial dollar savings via the reduction of the number of U.S. nuclear weapons. This claim, too, is demonstrably false. As Dr. Don Cook of the National Nuclear Security Administration and more recently Deputy Secretary of Defense Ash Carter have said openly, substantial savings are not possible from reducing the number of nuclear warheads or weapons, simply because many of the associated costs are set and essentially independent of the number of weapons. Uh, more importantly in this regard, the usual minimum deterrence claim that the U.S. can and should substitute conventional capabilities for deterrence purposes would surely increase U.S. defense spending. NATO essentially reached the same conclusion 50 years ago, and it remains true today. Third, the minimum deterrence claim that its definition of deterrence represents the, postular, po the proper measure of adequacy for the U.S. nuclear arsenal is also demonstrably false. Uh, this claims allow minimum deterrence to omit other considerations, other national priorities, such as the assurance of allies. Uh, that drive nuclear requirements beyond those recommended by minimum deterrence. But these other goals, such as the assurance of ally, must not be omitted from consideration. Those three minimum deterrence propositions, as I said, are demonstrably false. Others are merely highly dubious, and in most cases, contrary to experience and available evidence. For example, it simply is not possible to claim credibly that U.S. relations with Russia and China, now and in the future, are and will be so benign that the possibility of an acute crisis with them no longer needs to be part of our force sizing measure. Alexei Arbatov, the noted defense, Russian defense expert, report, reported recently that the beliefs of the current Russian leadership include the following. One, Russia is surrounded by enemies led by the United States. Two, the United States and its allies may invade Russia anytime to seize its natural riches. Three, nuclear weapons are the basis for Russian security, and correspondingly, U.S. calls for nuclear disarmament are a malicious trick. 
According to Arbatov, within Russia, these beliefs are not controversial. They may sound paranoid to everyone in this room, but Arbatov says within Russia, they are not even controversial. China, in turn, uh, currently is pressuring one of America's closest allies, <coughs> Japan, in an unprecedented fashion, going so far recently as to question Japan's sovereignty over Okinawa. Uh, Russian and Chinese open source discussions of threats and strategy point to the United States as enemy number one and to the corresponding great value they attribute to their nuclear weapons. In this context, there clearly is considerable opportunity for serious friction in U.S.-Russian relations and U.S.-Chinese relations. And making that point, I should add, is not to repeat the rhetoric of the Cold War. It simply is to acknowledge a contemporary reality uh, that many today would prefer to ignore or mock. In addition, it's impossible to claim credibly that deterrence will work reliably at much lower force numbers, now and in the future. These kind of unbounded promises are nonsense, because human decision-making and thus deterrence simply are not so predictable. Similarly, no one can claim credibly that U.S. conventional forces can provide adequately and predictably for deterrence purposes. They can substitute for nuclear weapons for deterrence. As Thomas Schelling recently observed, they never did in the past. Why should they in the future? The increasing lethality of conventional forces may mean much or may mean nothing for deterrence depending on how opponents view those forces, which again is not generally predictable with precision. Similarly, the minimum deterrence promise that some finite low number of nuclear weapons will be adequate for deterrence now in the future is akin to promising that some low set number and type of bullets will be adequate for U.S. security now and in the future. Such claims should not be taken seriously. Instead, deep nuclear reductions would likely degrade the U.S. Force, character, force characteristics that may be most important for deterrence in a highly dynamic environment. Those characteristics are the flexibility and diversity of the force necessary so that it can adapt to a dynamic, widely differing and shifting threat set of, set of threat scenarios. This flexibility and diversity ultimately is linked to the size and character of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. As Hegel said, quantity takes on a quality all its own. And further deep U.S. reductions now would threaten to degrade those critical deterrence qualities of the U.S. arsenal. So are there numbers in this regard other than those recommended by minimum deterrence, whether it's a few or a few hundred? Yes. In 2010, General Kevin Chilton, commander of strategic command at the time, stated openly, that the 1,550 deployed warhead ceiling of the New START Treaty was the lowest level that he can endorse, given the requirement for flexibility and diversity of the forces. And he later added that he could endorse that only because the bomber counting rule actually allowed considerably larger numbers on both sides, numbers of weapons on both sides. Similarly, in 2012, uh, General Kowalski, commander of the Global Strike Command, cautioned openly that any further reductions, quote, need to be bounded by the real politic, the real politic of international relations, close quote. He's precisely right. I know of no recent benign transformation of the international system that now suggests that a lower level of forces could be adequate for the purposes of retaining the flexibility and diversity and resilience of the arsenal necessary to be able to respond in a very dynamic threat environment. And in fact, it seems to me that the threat environment seems to be moving in the opposite direction. Likewise, the minimum deterrence claim that deep U.S. nuclear reductions would reduce the danger of accidents is contrary to available evidence. Let me say that again. The evidence shows that the claim that deep U.S. nuclear reductions will reduce the danger of accidents is contrary to the history, contrary to the history we have in the nuclear age. Historical data shows no correlation between the number of nuclear weapons and accidents. The prospect for accidents appears to be determined by factors other than the number of nuclear weapons. In addition, instead of helping with our non-proliferation goals, U.S. minimum deterrence force levels would in some cases likely contribute to proliferation. Why? Because some key allies, not all, I'm not saying all, some key allies already 
are worried about the U.S. nuclear disarmament trends in the context of the threat developments that they see around them. Further movement in this direction could easily further degrade the credibility of the U.S. assurances to these allies and correspondingly increase some allied interest in independent nuclear capabilities, thereby undermining U.S. nonproliferation goals. A recent open report by the Japanese Defense Ministry's policy research arm states that the credibility of the U.S. nuclear umbrella, and I quote, must be underpinned by a strong counterforce capability. The report goes on to say that if there is, quote, further progress in nuclear disarmament by the United States, U.S. allies will inevitably feel less confident in the U.S. nuclear umbrella, much less confident in the case of Japan. In addition, the usual minimum deterrence proposition that U.S. SSBN, submarines carrying ballistic missiles, that U.S. SSBN will remain invulnerable for another half century may be optimistic. This is a key minimum deterrence proposition because it's the basis for the claim that we can prudently reduce the number of SSBN down to eight, for example, and eliminate or reduce the other legs of the triad. I hope SSBN survivability can be sustained for 50 years. No doubt about that hope. But the possibilities for rapid technological advancement and surprise should caution us against basing U.S. policy on that hope. For decades, the United States has sustained the three legs of the nuclear triad to help guard against technological surprises. Despite the minimum deterrence claims, this continues to be a wise policy, as was recently recognized by the Obama administration. Finally, minimum deterrence claims that the United States can substitute advanced conventional forces for nuclear forces for our deterrence purposes and thereby inspire others to move away from nuclear weapons uh, simply is contrary to what we know about the relationship of nuclear and conventional weapons. Some states, including Russia, China, and North Korea, say that they place great emphasis on their nuclear weapons as the only means of defeating U.S. conventional advantages. The substitution of strengthened U.S. conventional capabilities as recommended by minimum deterrence is likely to lead these countries and others to emphasize their nuclear weapons even more, not to follow the U.S. lead to, towards nuclear disarmament. These various claims and promises that I've just briefly taken us through are at the heart of the minimum deterrence narrative. Together they are demonstrably false, uh, contrary to evidence, or imprudent at best. Let me close my portion of this talk by recalling that the noted diplomat George Kennan severely criticized the arms control and disarmament enthusiasms of the 1920s and 30s for their complete misunderstanding of the realities of the times and for helping to create the conditions that led to catastrophe, the catastrophe of World War II. The same might be said of, minimum, of the minimum deterrence approach to security today. The guidelines for U.S. thinking and policy regarding the proper measure of adequacy for U.S. forces should reflect a vivid, realistic understanding of contemporary security environment and available evidence. Uh, minimum deterrence, we concluded, reflects neither. With that, I'd like to turn the discussion back to my colleague, Ambassador Joseph. Okay, and I will be uh, brief. I do want to hear uh, Rebecca's review of the study. So let me take just a couple minutes and uh, address two basic assumptions that are often cited by minimum deterrence advocates that are related to arms control and to nonproliferation. And much more detail on both, of course, is uh, in the report. Preface my remark by, re remarks by saying that although the Obama administration has formally rejected minimum deterrence as a policy guide for the U.S. Uh, national deterrent, in many ways the assertions that I will highlight appear to be at the very center of its national security agenda. The first assertion is that moving to very low numbers of nuclear weapons will encourage other nuclear weapon states to join in arms control negotiations, leading to progressively greater nuclear reductions worldwide. And the second and interrelated assertion is that going to lower numbers, either through negotiated uh, agreements or through unilateral steps, will discourage others from proliferation and encourage international cooperation to prevent and to punish proliferators. Uh, neither of these assertions is supported by the evidence, and in fact, policies based on them could lead to a more proliferated world. 
Starting with arms control, Russia's response to President Obama's Berlin proposal to go down to 1,000 deployed strategic warheads undercuts the notion that if only the United States will lead by example toward the goal of nuclear zero, others will join in. Moscow has made very clear that it has no real interest in reversing its very ambitious, very aggressive ongoing nuclear modernization program, and it has placed condition after condition on even beginning negotiations. It has also outright rejected any discussion of reducing so-called non-strategic nuclear forces, a category of weapons in which it holds a massive advantage. The irony here is that through various arms control arrangements, the U.S. has given up its leverage to persuade Russia to go to lower numbers. In the 1991-1992 presidential nuclear initiatives, uh, the Bush 41 administration undertook major force reductions that were not reciprocated by Moscow, despite Moscow's stated willingness to do so. In the process, the United States eliminated the vast majority, 95 percent, of our theater nuclear capabilities and Russia retained its capabilities. The Obama administration has continued this pattern. Uh, it eliminated the TLAM N or SLICM uh, and got nothing in return. Why one would think going to a thousand or any further unilateral reductions would change Moscow's behavior can, in my view, only be explained as an article of faith. The reality, as noted in the NIPP report, is that additional deep cuts would only further erode U.S. leverage to motivate Russian and Chinese reductions. Russia, in particular, is increasing its reliance on nuclear forces in large part to meet what it sees as an overwhelming U.S. conventional advantage. The same sense of hope over experience can be seen in our experience with the ban on nuclear testing. Uh, while the United States has adopted a zero-yield standard for its testing moratorium as a means of leading by example, uh, this has not kept other states from testing, at least not India, Pakistan, and North Korea, and apparently Russia and China from conducting low-level tests. Turning to nonproliferation, the NIPP study provides a factual rebuttal to the assertion by minimum deterrence advocates that Article 6 of the NPT constitutes a legally binding commitment on the United States to eliminate our nuclear weapons independent, independent of an agreement on complete and general disarmament. While this shift was evident in the final report of the 2010 NPT review conference and in the President's Prague speech, it is not based on sound legal footings, and I would refer you to the report for that discussion, and especially to the quote by Spurgeon Keeney, uh, who, when he was working for Henry Kissinger in 1969 on the NSC staff, stated, and I quote, Article 6 commits all parties to pursue negotiations in good faith relating to a cessation of the arms race and to nuclear disarmament. This is an essentially oratory statement that presents no problems. Unquote. As for the policy assertions made by the minimum deterrence school on proliferation, none hold up under close scrutiny. First, we often hear that countries like North Korea are motivated to acquire nuclear weapons in part because of, the, of their fear of the U.S. nuclear force. The corollary is that if the U.S. would only reduce its nuclear forces, this will reduce incentives to proliferate. The problem with this argument is that there is no evidence to support it. More significant, as Dr. Payne pointed out, is the fear of U.S. conventional superiority, which is, also from my personal experience with Libya, much more of a factor than our strategic deterrence in the minds of the leaders of some proliferant states. For other proliferators like India and Pakistan, the motiv motivation to prolif proliferate really have nothing to do with the U.S. military force, but rather with perceived regional threats and the desire for great power status. Let me finish with two final points on the proliferation arguments of minimum deterrence. The first is the assertion that if the U.S. goes to even lower numbers, the international community will agree to increased pressure and punishment of state proliferators. The NIPP report points out that while sanctions have certainly increased and increased significantly on Iran and North Korea, this is a consequence of their provocative actions, not U.S. nuclear reductions. The contrived three-rail bank shot, which Secretary Clinton was very fond of citing, 
That is, the U.S. would negotiate New START. That would lead to an NPT review conference that would be successful in getting a consensus document, which in turn would encourage the international community to come together and impose sanctions on proliferators. Is just that. It is contrived and unsupported by the facts. Finally, and my greatest concern is that mi the minimum deterrent prescription and the policies of the Obama administration will lead to the opposite outcome that is sought, and that is if the U.S. goes to very low nuclear numbers, we will encourage proliferation, both horizontal and vertical. Since my time at the State Department, when I was responsible for proliferation issues, I have firmly held the view that our most important non-proliferation tool is our nuclear guarantee and the credibility of our extended deterrent. Today, as Dr. Payne points out, allies are beginning to question the credibility and the effectiveness of our nuclear force. Japanese diplomats in private have been very direct. The NIPP report cites a poll in South Korea in which over 60 percent, over 60 percent of the respondents supported the return of U.S. nuclear weapons to the peninsula and a national nuclear capability. One reason for this may be that the U.S. nuclear force has gone down by over 85 percent since, since the 1960s. All other nuclear weapon states today are modernizing and most are expanding their nuclear arsenals. If we continue our decline in terms of both numbers and in overall capabilities as reflected in the erosion of our nuclear weapons infrastructure and in policies such as those mandating no new capabilities, we raise the risk of a more dangerous and proliferated world. With that, let me turn it over to Rebecca. Thank you. This is the football team, and I'm the cheerleader here, so I'm going to um, keep my remarks very short so you can get back to um, maybe asking some questions here at the end. Pundits and analysts have tried over the past few weeks to make sense of and articulate the president's foreign policy. Nobody has succeeded in doing this. It has been marked by incoherency and a complete lack of strategy. This has not been true of the president's nuclear agenda. The President stated his goal in 2009 in Prague. He affirmed America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons, and that the U.S. will take concrete steps towards a world without nuclear weapons. And he has done this. He has been pursuing it steadily ever since. He signed the New START Treaty in 2011, taking the U.S. down to 1550 deployed strategic nuclear weapons. And before the ink has even dried on that treaty, then in Berlin this year he said he would pursue another round of cuts unilaterally if needed. And remember, this is before the president has even uh, delivered the promised funds to modernize the force that we already have. But what is driving this agenda? And I actually believe that many Americans might intuitively now at this point agree with some of the assumptions they continue to hear from the Global Zero crowd. And this is perhaps one of the greatest merits of this report. It lays out the best arguments of those who support minimum deterrence and addresses them head on in an incredibly clear way that is accessible to the American population. It doesn't take a nuclear scientist to understand these arguments and to wrestle with what they mean for American security. The three most powerful arguments made by those who support minimum deterrence, in my opinion, are the first three actually laid out in this report. Dr. Payne already covered them um, to some detail, and I'll just kind of go over them. Um, a little bit here just to amplify what he already said. Number one, the deterrence will function reliably and predictably at low U.S. nuclear force numbers now and in the future, and that U.S. conventional forces, it's non-nuclear forces, can substitute in many cases for nuclear forces to meet deterrence goals. Now, the report responds to that argument in part by explaining that foreign leaders may not respond to scenarios the, same, the way minimum deterrence assumes that they would, and a leader of one country certainly might not have behaved the same way as a leader of another country. And yet now we live in a world where multiple countries have nuclear weapons or are in determined pursuit of them. We also know that conventional weapons do not technically have the same effect as nuclear weapons, nor do they have the same psychological effect. And so although conventional weapons do complement nuclear weapons in our strategic policy, they cannot replace them. As former Strategic Command Commander General Chilton said on this point, we have to be careful when we start talking about one-for-one -one substitutions of conventional weapons for nuclear weapons because the nuclear weapon has a deterrent factor that far exceeds a conventional threat, end quote. I might also add that the Obama administration in defense um, of this latest little mini NPR uh, said that 
one, since we're going to be able to rely less on nuclear weapons, that we can rely more not only on conventional weapons, but also on missile defense. Um, and this is completely incredible and should not be taken seriously. This administration has failed to adequately support U.S. missile defense system uh, since President Obama has uh, taken office and has underfunded it by roughly $6 billion as compared to what the previous administration had planned for what would be needed for the last several years. And the budget is expected to go lower. We can no longer sustain, test, and deploy the system we currently have adequately with the resources the administration plans to allot, let alone improve this system to, the, to defend against the sophisticated threats that are upon us. Uh, number two, um, one of the most popular assumptions that I hear uh, in my studies is that nuclear deterrence considerations are no longer pertinent to U.S. relations with Russia and China. We hear this a lot. The Cold War is over. The Cold War is over. Why, are we ha why do we have this enormous nuclear arsenal to defend or to deter um, the Russian Federation? And the report lays out why this assumption is not only wrong, but incredibly dangerous and utterly unsupported by the facts. Both countries are relying more on their nuclear weapons, not less, despite Russia reset. In fact, Michelle Flournoy, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy for the Obama administration, said on this point, if you read recent military doctrine, they are actually increasing their reliance on nuclear weapons and the role of nuclear weapons in their strategy, end quote. That's the Russians. And the third um, argument uh, that I often hear is that nuclear weapons are irrelevant to handle um, nuclear terrorism. I hear this a lot in Congress, even from um, many members who um, support a robust defense. They say, if terrorists armed with nuclear weapons are the most pressing threat, how do we deter them? These groups don't fear retaliation. They don't fear death. So how do you deter uh, nuclear terrorism? Again, here this report steers us back on course, revealing that state sponsors of terrorism are responsive to credible threats, and that nuclear deterrence does in fact play a significant role in the deterrence of nuclear terrorism. Now these are just three of the assumptions covered in depth in this report, and I think it does our country a great service to think about how and why we have nuclear weapons and what purpose they do serve. After all, peace should be the goal. The credible threat of employment of American nuclear weapons is what deters aggression and protects Americans and our allies, a force that is not suited for today's threats or tomorrow's, nor satisfies our allies under the umbrella, could have the disastrous consequence of increasing proliferation and creating the very dangerous and destabilizing environment we all wish to avoid. And so with that, I commend to you the report and turn it back over to my colleagues. Thank you very much. So now it's your opportunity to ask questions. Please ask questions, don't make statements, and introduce yourself before asking the question. Hi, I'm Hunter Hustis from the uh, Air Staff at the Pentagon. Oh, Hunter Hustis, I'm with the Air Force at the Air Staff at the Pentagon. I'm wondering if you could talk, another argument that comes out uh, recently is one about decision time and the posture of the force, the, the alert status of the force. In, in current debate. I was wondering if you could comment about a little bit about that and how that plays out in security. Sure. No, I'm happy to. In, in fact, I think all of us at this table and in most rooms that at least I've been in, uh, folks are quite interested in maximizing decision time. Uh, nobody that I know of would like to minimize the available time for decision making. Uh, that said, most of the recommendations that I see coming out of the minimum deterrence uh, proponents, I don't think addresses that problem realistically. Let me just give you an example. Uh, having a missile, having an alert missile, in my mind, is one of the best ways of prolonging decision making time. Having an alert, survivable missile is one of the best ways of preserving decision making time. Why? Uh, because it's very quick to target. And it's survivable, and the presumption that it's survivable means you don't have to launch it to save it. Uh, so the, the idea of that, that ICBMs mated with nuclear weapons are somehow uh, the, the villain in this story just strikes me as contrary to the fact that a president can have all the time he or she wants to make a decision, all the time that the context allows, with the confidence, if the president's confident that the ICBMs are both survivable and can strike rapidly. 
Another question? In that case, let me uh, not ask a question, but add to one point that has been made, because I think it's a very important point. Uh, Eric Edelman and I uh, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post not too long ago, which addressed our concerns about further reductions. And there was a response in the Washington Post. And that response was basically, well, we need to go lower and lower. If the Russians if the Russians want to waste their money, their scarce resources on nuclear weapons, we'll let them. And I think this is a common theme in the minimum deterrence uh, ar argument. There is sort of a disconnect in our thinking about the relevance of nuclear weapons. There is a sense that these are Cold War relics. Yes, we may need a few. We may need a few to deter North Korea, but North Korea has a small force. Iran, if and when it requires nuclear weapons, will certainly be, never be able to match the United States. And we don't need to worry about China, which is ascending, or about Russia. Let me just relate one war story to you. And that is, in the fall of 2008, uh, this was after the invasion of Georgia, shortly after, within weeks of the invasion of Georgia, I was asked to go to uh, Moscow to give a speech on U.S.-Russian relations post-Georgia. I gave my speech and I was uh, done with it, coming, coming down, and I was taken aside by two gentlemen. Uh, one was a uh, active colonel, uh, head of the USA Department at the MOT, and the other uh, was a, I learned later, a retired uh, military uh, general officer uh, in the intelligence corps. <coughs> And they asked me, they said, did you know that in the context of Georgia, we were planning and preparing for a nuclear exchange with the United States? And I said, no. Uh, that's why I probably said that after my mouth hit the floor. I came back and I asked some questions. And I asked of the, of the hundreds, if not thousands, of US analysts who were following every single minute detail of Georgia and the Russian invasion. Was there any thought on the part of the United States that this might actually, in the eyes of the Russians, not in our eyes, but in the eyes of Moscow, lead to a nuclear exchange? And I think quite clearly the answer is no. We have lost sort of the sense of the relevance of nuclear weapons. And let me tell you, that's a very dangerous proposition if others see it differently, if others with nuclear weapons and a greater reliance in their doctrine on nuclear weapons see it differently. We need to think about nuclear weapons. We need to take, out, take, take the old, tired arguments apart. We need to identify their relevance in today's world. This is not the Cold War, but they remain very relevant in a very dangerous world in which we are seen as a principal adversary by nuclear powers. Still, do you have any more questions from the audience? Then I'll ask a question. One of my favorite parts of the report is the relevance of deterrence for non-state actors. Um, could you please elaborate a little more on that point? More specifically, that it is not, we have historical cases where terrorists were deterred and there might be possibility to do so in the future. Sure. Uh, you know, a, a common um, bumper sticker around Washington for, oh, what, two decades now or so is that terrorists are undeterrable. And they're undeterrable because they have no return address or because they don't have a capital, they don't have subjects or citizens, and therefore how can they possibly be deterred? Or just that they're irrational and therefore they can't be deterred. So the general notion is it's little less strongly held today than in the past, but uh, terrorists and terrorist organizations are undeterrable. Uh, let me suggest that that view is ignorant of at least 200 years of history. Uh, one of the exercises uh, I was privileged enough to be involved in was going back and looking at case studies uh, over the last 200 years. We started with the Barbary Pirates and Thomas Jefferson, 
and uh, worked our way forward up until virtually the present. Uh, we looked at 11 case studies of states versus terrorist organizations to find out whether deterrence was operative, if the states had intentional efforts to deter, or if they stumbled into deterrence, but in any effect, whether deterrence was possible. And let me suggest that the terrorists involved in these case studies were every bit as violent and eccentric as our current terrorists. And what we found from this set of case studies over the last 200 years is that the terrorists indeed can be deterrable. It doesn't mean that they always will be deterrable under all circumstances. That's not the case. But that's not the case with state leaders either. What you find is that if a state is able to identify the levers that it needs to be able to pull and hold at risk, that some deterrent effect is measurable and visible against terrorist organizations some of the time. And that some of the past terrorist activities that we were most concerned about were in fact, were in fact uh, minimized or eliminated by deterrent effect. Uh, so what we took with, from that was to, the effort to uh, look at what are those conditions that are most conducive to deterrence working. And I won't do the whole study here, but we could actually systematically go through and identify under some sets of conditions, deterrence is much more likely to be effective and, and, uh, and in operation. In other cases, maybe not. But again, the same thing is true with regard to trying to deter state leaders just different sets of conditions, not the same sets of conditions, different sets of conditions. So with that as a, as the, as a substance of, of, of the connection between deterrence and non-state actors, the next question is, but does that mean that nuclear deterrence has any role to play? And again, we took a look at history, and surprisingly enough, there actually is some case study evidence where nuclear deterrence helped play a role in deterring terrorism. Uh, in this case, it was the Soviet Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hezbollah. Some of you may remember this case study. You may have read of it, uh, where workers at the Soviet embassy were kidnapped in Lebanon. They were taken hostage. Uh, KGB, local KGB, immediately got involved. In fact, the head of the KGB in the area has now written a book on this subject, and you can you can get it and read it if you like. There's a, and some uh, documentaries on it in Russian television. And what we now know uh, from these kind of report, this kind of reporting is that the Soviet Union decided to press the matter locally. They engaged in some very grisly threats against the local terrorists in Lebanon. Uh, and I won't describe the grisly threats, just take my word for it. The KGB in, engaged in some very grisly threats against the local terrorists. But the lead KGB operative in this case uh, went to Tehran uh, and met with the handlers, the state sponsors of Hezbollah, and said, if you don't give our folks back, I'm paraphrasing obviously, if you don't give our folks back, there will be a missile accident and the target may be Kuang. Uh, within days, the three remaining uh, Soviet nationals were returned and there was a notice in the local newspaper that said, we're doing this in fraternal, in fraternal uh, brotherhood with our Soviet friends. And the KGB uh, person in charge of this noted, I never described whether this missile would be nuclear or conventional. I left that implicit. So when I, when I hear sort of these banal, easy statements that one, terrorists are beyond deterrence and nuclear weapons can never contribute to deterrence, just go back. Take a look at history, and what you'll find is that the cases, the evidence, suggests that neither of those statements is likely to be entirely true or true over, completely over time. Thank you. Rebecca? I'd, I'd like to hear um, perhaps both of you talk a little bit more about um, how, how the U.S.'s actions over the last several years uh, might actually increase proliferation. Um, and specifically in two points, because um, I find it incredibly ironic that although this administration is on this you know, very serious pursuit of uh, shrinking the number of <coughs> nuclear weapons worldwide by shrinking ours, um, that it might actually have the unintended consequences of actually spurring proliferation elsewhere. 
And I've seen it in two ways. One, we might see Iran obtain a nuclear weapons capability during this administration. Um, and then what kind of effect will that have on um, the rest of the Middle East? How long will it be before the Saudis then decide to pursue a, their own nuclear capability? Um, so it seems as though um, that's one possibility. In the other way, we, we've also heard that you know while Russia and China are focusing more on their nu nuclear weapons capabilities, that at some point, if the United States is, uh, goes down to a certain level, a level unknown, it might actually spur the Chinese to quickly build up to actually try to reach parity with the United States. Um, that's been expressed uh, multiple times during congressional hearings. So you could just address that point. Um, I think that'd be very helpful. Well, let me start with uh, one more personal experience. In October of 2006, North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon. Within a couple days, Secretary Rice was on an airplane. She asked me to go with her. This was going to be about nuclear proliferation. Our first stop was in Tokyo. And immediately upon our arrival, we were urged, we were urged by the Prime Minister, a guy named Abe, uh, and uh, Foreign Minister Aso at the time, uh, two men who are very prominent today in the Japanese government. And their plea to us was to reaffirm in no uncertain terms the nuclear guarantee of the United States. They were concerned about the threat environment in the region. They were concerned about North Korea's proliferation activities and the effect that might have not just in the region but on the NPT regime generally. And they were also concerned about the prospect that Japan may have to go nuclear uh, if, in fact, uh, they could not rely on the U.S. nuclear guarantee. This goes to my point that the number one nonproliferation tool, in my experience, is a strong, a credible nuclear guarantee. And without that, we do risk vertical and horizontal proliferation, as I mentioned vertical proliferation in the context, perhaps, of, uh, of China, where you would have uh, perhaps an incentive to match the United States if we were to go to lower and lower numbers. Why wouldn't they? For decades, they have chosen not to. But why put that incentive out there? And if we do go to those levels, what's the effect on our regional allies? Not, not just in Tokyo, but Seoul and, and, and other allies. What's the effect on, uh, on our Middle Eastern allies if we're not seen as credible? And let me tell you, uh, with recent events, I think the credibility of the United States has taken a real hit. If I'm sitting in Saudi Arabia and advising the king or advising the other governments of the region, I'm thinking very seriously about going nuclear because we've not demonstrated the, the credibility of the U.S. resolve to stop proliferation. And I think that's absolutely key. It's absolutely key for the objective that we all seek, and that is to stop proliferation, to avoid providing countries with reasons, or, and particularly our friends, uh, uh, you know, with, with reasons to, uh, to proliferate. And as for our adversaries, if we're not perceived as credible, if we're not perceived as capable, I think it's going to be a much more dangerous world. Let me uh, add to what Ambassador Joseph has uh, just uh, noted to a, a couple of additional anecdotes that I think tell a lot. Uh, these are discussions that I've uh, had with uh, allies, uh, allied officials, not, not, uh, not uh, academics, but allied officials. And I won't mention the names of the countries, but just give you an idea of the things that allied officials are saying in private. Uh, one senior allied official of a, of a very key ally was talking about where the U.S. is going in its non-nuclear direction towards nuclear disarmament. Uh, what he said was, don't you know, referring to me as the United States, don't you know that our security is tied up in your nuclear capability? Uh, he, said, and he said, you are really beginning to piss us off. A very undiplomatic statement but very expressive. You're really beginning to piss us off. 
those are not the kind of statements you'll hear coming out of UN speeches or public speeches. Those are the kind of statements you will hear, at least on occasion, in private discussions. Another allied official, again, a senior allied official, uh, again, private discussions, he said, you know, given where you're going with your nuclear forces, and the way you seem to be uh, conciliating in various ways, said, we feel like it's 1938 all over again, and you are the United Kingdom. The Saudis have said officially that if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, Saudi has to have a nuclear weapon. Turkey has, some Turkish officials have said, said publicly, excuse me, that if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, uh, Turkey may have to have nuclear weapons. This is, this is an emerging theme among some allies. As Ambassador Joseph mentioned earlier, uh, the South Korean poll showed that over two-thirds of the population now wants in South Korea, well, once South Korean nuclear weapons and U.S. nuclear weapons reintroduced to the peninsula. Now, believe me, what neither of us, none of us up here are saying, I'm sure, is look out, all of our allies are, going, are about to go nuclear. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that parts of U.S. policies and the trend in the threat environment is putting our, some of our allies in very precarious positions. And we ought not to pretend like that's not the case. And part of their security system is wrapped up in U.S. nuclear capabilities. And they're really interested in U.S. nuclear capabilities at this point. In the talk chat with uh, uh, another senior allied official, he said, you know, in the past, we could basically go to sleep because we figured that you all were doing the right thing. And we didn't even watch. But now we realize we have to wake up. So, Again, I'm not suggesting, no one's suggesting, look at these allies that are about to go nuclear. That's not the point. The point is we're putting them in precarious positions where they have to think about things that they, by their own statements, didn't have to think about before. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that, uh, I guess, segues from what, what's just been said and to ask about deterrence in terms of uh, public perception and political will. Um, obviously, you can't threaten to use nuclear weapons if you don't have them or if people don't think you have them. But having them, uh, it then interacts with what public opinion and politics and the particular individuals who are credible in, in either threatening, you use weapons both by threatening to use them and then actually by using them. And the threat so far has been the main use of nuclear weapons. If the public does not support and sees nuclear as somehow very different than any other weapon, and this is kind of occasioned partly by uh, what happened in Syria, most people after World War I saw chemical weapons as somehow far worse than conventional other kinds of weapons. Today, that seems to have waned. A lot of people kind of said, well, if, if 100,000 people in Syria have been killed conventionally and 1,000 by chemical weapons, why are chemical weapons a cause of war if a, for 1,000 deaths and 100,000 by conventional weapons. The, to, with nuclear weapons, it seems the widespread public opinion is that anything connected with the adjective nuclear is far worse. And the political will of political leaders responsive to that political perception are then weakened in the implied or actually threat to use them. Obama may be an extreme example, but I think broadly U.S. leadership has trouble dealing with that, from no first use to other things. Uh, a few comments on that, if you could. Sure. You start? Go ahead. Well, just, just a couple responses. Uh, one is that nuclear weapons are very different 
nuclear weapons are profoundly different than any other type of instrument that we have. Nuclear weapons are used, as Dr. Schlesinger says, every day nuclear weapons are used to keep the peace as a deterrent. And if we think about the world prior to 1945, and specifically the two world wars of the first half of the 20th century, that was a nuclear-free world in which we had, in those wars, over 100 million casualties. World War II, 26 million Soviet casualties alone. Deaths, not just casualties. I think what we need to do is to continue to educate, to continue to make the right arguments associated with nuclear deterrence. I mean, the American public has been very supportive over the years of nuclear deterrence. But I think the administration, this, this administration, has not only cut the capabilities of the force and has let the nuclear infrastructure and our nuclear posture erode, uh, but it also has raised fundamental questions about the utility of nuclear weapons. And I would argue about the morality of nuclear weapons. And I think this has had a very negative effect. I think it's had a very negative effect on those men and women who are in uniform, who work every day to protect this nation and to deter attack through their contributions on the nuclear force. And it's had, it's had a, 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 a very uh, corrosive effect politically on the debate. And I think we do need, through efforts like Dr. Payne and, and, and Dr. Schlesinger's uh, report get out there with the right arguments to ensure that we do have public support, support in Congress and elsewhere that's key to maintaining our nuclear deterrent. Right, and I just add to that the views that Ambassador Joseph and I uh, share on that is that uh, likely the employment of nuclear weapons, actually employment, they're used every day for deterrence purposes. The actual employment of nuclear weapons uh, could very well be a, a catastrophe beyond compare. So again, don't hear anything up here saying that nuclear weapons uh, as an employment instrument are likely to somehow be mild or a moderate occasion. It's likely to be a catastrophe beyond compare. That said, uh, nuclear deterrence is the tool to, to prevent that catastrophe. And what often, often happens is that we mistake the tool to prevent it for the catastrophe. Uh, nuclear deterrence, we know, we know uh, has served to prevent war and to prevent the escalation of war uh, since the Cold War. There's enough history on that. There's enough access to credible history on that. But we know that's true. So nuclear deterrence is to prevent the catastrophe that the nu use of nuclear weapons almost, almost certainly would be. That's why I think that we should work very hard to make deterrence as effective and as good as it can be, because it serves such an important purpose. Uh, which is why I say about minimum deterrence that minimum deterrence deserves the same admonition that George Kinnan gave to the disarmament moves of the 20s and 30s didn't recognize the realities of the time, and they helped set the conditions for catastrophe. But let me add, just take another minute and add to the question on public opinion, because public opinion, I find very interesting on this subject. And if you want to take a look at some various serious polls, longitudinal polls, over a long period of time, polls done by the Sandia National Laboratory, and I believe they were picked up by the University of New Mexico after they were no longer done by Sandia. And what they did was poll general public, and then they polled what they called sort of elite sentiment, elite views, where they went to state legislatures and other government officials and so on. And then they compared the types of answers given by the two groups. And in general, uh, and this is a whole series of polls done, I believe, every year for a long, long period of time. In general, what you found was that the American public was uh, much different. The views of the American public as reflected in these polls was considerably different from the views of the, of the so-called elites that were being polled. Uh, much less interested in saying that the United States should have fewer nuclear weapons than uh, at the time the Soviet Union. Much less interested in taking the sort of uh, canonical 
anti-nuclear positions that typically were more acceptable to the elite in this, in this series of surveys. Uh, I'm, I was interested in seeing a poll, this was right before the first Gulf War, a poll that said, should the United States consider using nuclear weapons if there's a, if there's a war in the Gulf? This was just before the Gulf War, as thing, first Gulf War, as things were looking, looking like they could turn into war. I believe it was roughly 75% of the public said, no, the United States should not consider using nuclear weapons. 25% said, yes, the United States should consider it. And that's what I would expect from such a poll. As the war actually took place and went on, there was a, it was either the same, same polling question or a very similar polling question. Should the United States use nuclear weapons in this case if it'll bring the war to an end and reduce casualties? In this case, the responses, the percentages, were exactly flipped. 75% of the public said yes, 25% of the public said no. So I think that the public sentiment, if you actually try and capture public sentiment in a very serious way, tends to be at least somewhat different from what is the notion of public sentiment uh, that uh, pervades probably within Washington in particular. Let me just add one, one further point to that. It was uh, President Kennedy who said that the United States must maintain a nuclear force second to none. And it was that sort of guiding principle that was followed by every president uh, until, I would argue, until today. Now the conditions have changed. I think our country has changed. President Kennedy also said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's old thing today, it seems, unfortunately. But my point is that with regard to the nuclear posture, I believe that the American public continue to support a nuclear force that's second to none. And if you say to the American public that we should accept a force that's inferior to the Russian force or inferior in the future to the Chinese force, you'll find a firm rejection of that. Uh, even the elites, even the elite within the defense intellectual community, I think, uh, would have trouble with accepting a capability that's second to others. Some segment of the elite would. Again, if the Russians want to waste their money on nuclear weapons, let them waste their money. But I think that's uh, a minority view even within the elite. We'll take last two questions together. Please introduce yourself before asking questions. Soldier Ree with uh, SBS Seoul Broadcasting System. Uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, uh, one brief uh, comment is that uh, the idea that uh, South Koreans want United States nuclear we weapons back to South Korean soil is, a, in fact, a very isolated idea. Uh, it's not a mainstream. It's overstated. And my question is that <coughs> I'm sorry I didn't uh, read all the report. But, uh, what would be the future of uh, extended deterrence by nuclear umbrella under the doctrine of minimum deterrence? If the, uh, if the views reflected in the poll of the Korean people, uh, if the poll's inaccurate, uh, then the poll's inaccurate. But it, it, it depends on who does the poll. Apparently, this poll was a nationwide poll for South Korea. I'm just reflecting what the poll's results were. So if, if you disagree with that, you disagree with the poll. I'm simply refle reflecting what that poll told us. Okay. Uh, what, is, what does minimum deterrence look like, excuse me, what does extended deterrence look like under minimum deterrence? And generally, I'll give you the, the general answer to that, that, and that is that uh, a very small number, very small number of U.S. nuclear weapons, again, sometimes it's down to a handful, sometimes it's in the hundreds. Uh, will be adequate for extended deterrence um, because it will be supplemented, and this is the more recent version of this point, it will be supplemented by U.S. advanced conventional forces and by U.S. missile defense capabilities. Now, uh, I'm, I'm certainly a supporter of U.S. advanced conventional capabilities and U.S. missile defense, uh, but we've, we've, we've had a chance to, to ask allies, uh, can we go down to minimum deterrence levels. 
and do you still, are you still assured at that level? And what you find is a very mixed bag in terms of the answer. Uh, many say, no, uh, the U.S. nuclear capability has to have certain characteristics for our assurance. In fact, uh, there's been some public statements by Japanese officials to this effect. And those characteristics are not contained within minimum deterrence. Last question. Um, I'm Ben Stovall, intern here at Heritage, actually. Um, my question to you is, uh, based off the fact that there seems to be a disconnect uh, between the two groups trying to discuss disarmament, and that is uh, those who are arguing for disarmament <coughs> seem to be looking at nuclear weapons from a tactical standpoint, that is simply target to target what the nuclear capabilities can do in a military situation. And when you look at it that way, it may at times make sense for disarmament uh, because you only need so many for that. Whereas those of us who are arguing against it are looking more at the strategic broad spectrum, as you were saying earlier, it goes back a lot of times to the psychological effect, to the political effect of nuclear arms. Uh, and thankfully, that's been predominantly what nuclear weapons are used for. Um, my question has to do with um, how do you think we can educate people on the fact that most of the strength and most of the reason that nuclear weapons work is this psychological effect. For instance, when we used them in Japan during the Second World War, it wasn't so much that we had two major bombs that did so much damage as it was the fact that we had two major bombs so close to each other that in effect we bluffed uh, Japan to believe that we had the armament that we do actually nowadays have uh, and that hamstringing ourselves back to those numbers of having too few would in effect completely nullify uh, that advantage that we currently have. Let me just very briefly say that uh, our discussion, of course, and the approach that's taken in the report looks at nuclear weapons primarily in the strategic context. If you get down to the tactical context and you get down to sort of targeting, I would, st I would state that uh, what we need to do is have advanced conventional capabilities take full advantage of our advanced conventional capabilities and our missile defense capabilities in order to give the United States, the President, in a decision-making role, more options so that he doesn't have to go to nuclear weapons. And I think that's very important because, again, this is not about using nuclear weapons. This is about deterring conflict and the importance of nuclear weapons in, in a deterrence context. And let me just add that one of the distinctions is, uh, is, the, is the means to deter. The distinction between those who favor disarmament, deep reductions to minimum deterrence, and those who are skeptical is how do you go about deterring? Uh, minimum deterrence typically, not always, but typically is presented as, a, as if deterrence is targeted against an opponent's cities. That tends to be the measure of merit. So the opponent cities. Can you destroy opponent cities? And there are a number of quotes in the report. You can see these. Let me just give you a couple of examples from minimum deterrence proposals and proponents. Uh, one, deterrence today would remain stable even if retaliation against only 10 cities were assured. What's the target? Cities. A limited nuclear attack involving just 300 nuclear weapons could kill 75 million Russians immediately and millions more in weeks and months to follow. Another one, the United States needs relatively few words to deter China. A limited and highly accurate U.S. attack on China's 20 long-range ballistic missiles would result in as many as 11 million casualties. Another one, no sane, no sane adversary would believe that any political or military advantage would be worth a significant risk of the destruction of his own society. Thus, 10 to, 10 to 100 survival warheads would be more than enough. Another one, having 100 nuclear warheads will deter others from using nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons or from engaging even in conventional attacks. And I'll, just, I'll skip through these and just give you one last one. The United States and the Soviet Union each has about 270 urban areas with a population of more than 100,000. Imagine what several hundred nuclear warheads could do to either country. We must recommit ourselves to a doctrine of assured retaliation. We must reject the nuclear warfighting doctrine. So the distinction 
I think the, the points that you make are, are worthy points, but the distinction, the distinction also has to do with what is it that the United States does to deter? And what usually accompanies minimum deterrence proposals is the targeting of cities. And because, as the last quote I mentioned said, there aren't that many cities uh, in any of our opponents or potential opponents' borders, and cities are big and soft, and they don't run around, they don't hide underground, uh, they're relatively easy targets, and therefore it doesn't take many nuclear weapons to pose a threat to cities. Uh, I think that's probably factually uh, true. The question is, and the question that skeptics of minimum deterrence put forward is, does that mean that cities should be the target for U.S. nuclear deterrence? Uh, we tend to reject that. Uh, one is because if there is a crisis, it doesn't do the United States any good to destroy the top 270 cities of the Russian Federation. There's no value in that. And not only is there no value in that, it's a gross violation of the just war principles uh, that prohibits intentional targeting of non-combatants. It's illegal under international law as recognized by the United States. Uh, nor do we want to lead or in any way contribute to a city targeting campaign. Why on earth would we do that? Uh, we should want to preserve a no cities approach to the extent possible. Now, minimum deterrence uh, proponents sometimes say in response to that point, well, there's no meaningful difference in the number of casualties between intentional targeting of cities or counter-force targeting. That's just demonstrably false. We know that there can be an enormous difference in casualty levels with the appropriate kind of city avoidance targeting for deterrence purposes. So in this case, it's not that anybody is looking forward to employment of nuclear weapons. It's the type of threat, what's the nature of the threat, and what are the consequences of that threat. And it seems to me that the United States should never want to engage in a campaign against cities for those reasons that I just mentioned, immoral under the just work guidelines, illegal under international law. In addition to that, it's probably an incredible approach to, de incredible approach to deterrence in many cases. An incredible approach to deterrence. So you think about if an opponent has nuclear retaliatory capabilities, do we want to start throwing nuclear weapons at cities? Of course not. Of course not. What if the opponent does not have nuclear retaliatory capabilities? Uh, it may well be seen, and I think rightly so, that the United States is not going to be interested in annihilating the society of an opponent in that context. I mean, we're involved in rebuilding the societies, and we try very hard to avoid collateral damage. Do we really want to have a nuclear deterrent policy that's based on destroying cities? Uh, incredible, immoral, illegal. Other than that, it's a great idea. <laughs> so with that, please join me in thanking Ambassador Joseph, Professor Payne, and Rebecca Heinrichs.